Society for Participatory Medicine and previous past president. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Cancer 101 Foundation, uh, which is an organization that helps patients and caregivers navigate the care journey in partnership with their care teams. Uh, I'm also the founder of the Health Collaboratory, which is an innovations hub that's focused on amplifying the voice of patients and caregivers in the design, development, and continuous improvement of innovations designed to serve them. It's an honor to kick off the Learning Exchange, which was actually woven into our uh, strategic plan several years ago, as we recognized that many of our SPM members were either working on participatory medicine initiatives in their day-to-day -day work or practicing participatory medicine in their day-to-day -day lives. You could go to the next slide, please. As many of you are aware, participatory medicine is a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to responsible drivers of their health and in which providers encourage and value them as full partners. SPM's mission is to catalyze collaborative partnerships across the continuum of care to optimize health and healthcare. Now the Society's foundation is based upon four pillars, which include community building, where our goal is to stimulate awareness and foster collaboration among all stakeholders to advance participatory medicine, Advocacy and policy, where our goal is to advocate for policies that support the core premise of participatory medicine. And third, research, where our goal is to cultivate forums for exchange of research, data, and ideas regarding the adoption of participatory medicine. And lastly, where our goal is to develop and disseminate resources, tools, and curricula that encourage the adoption of participatory medicine practices. These goals were created as a result of extensive interviews with our members and other key stakeholders within the community. The beauty of these goals is that many of you are already out there working on these pillars and advancing participatory medicine. Next slide, please. Now, the Learning Exchange was created to help you showcase your work. Understanding the work we're conducting in our individual silos can help us learn from one another, allow us to build upon ideas, forge collaborations, provide a forum for feedback and suggestions, and hopefully avoid duplication of efforts. The learning exchange allows us to also capture how we're collectively moving the needle. Next slide, please. Now to kick off the learning exchange, members of the Society's Executive Committee will present some of their work as it relates to advancing participatory medicine on a day-to-day -day basis, just to get the ideas flowing but then we'll encourage you to submit your work for presentation during the next learning exchange. We'll have four presentations today over the next hour and I encourage you to submit your questions via the questions function throughout the presentations and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the very end. We'll hear from SPM's current president Jonathan Wald, SPM's secretary Nancy Finn, and SPM's member at large Peter Elias. And the perspectives will include those from a patient, an advocate and researcher, as well as physicians. The webinar will be archived for you to view at a later point and or share with others. Uh, next slide, please. That's me, uh, <laughs> for those who don't know me. As the Learning Exchange organizer and moderator, I also get to be the first guinea pig. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss a few platforms that I've been working on for a few years now. The patient voice is a term we hear more frequently across healthcare which might denote patient presence at a conference, uh, patient participation on a panel, or an advisory work group. And at times, the patient voice can be a symbolic checkbox where there was patient inclusion. But I'm going to discuss moving beyond just the voice of the patient and amplifying the roar of the patient and caregiver in innovation through elements such as participatory co-design. Next slide, please. Now, to empower patients and caregivers to partner with innovators, I've created what's called the Patient Shark Tank, where basically any innovator, any person, organization that's created a patient-centric solution can present their concept, their initiative, to a panel of patients and or caregivers who ask targeted questions based upon their experiences to understand how the innovation uniquely addresses their needs. Patient and caregiver panelists provide perspective on the design, the development, and even the continuous improvement of innovations designed to serve them. Next slide. We've co-designed a, a scorecard that the panelists use to assess the innovation that's broken out into 12 domains. And the insights allow the innovator to either go back to the drawing board or charge forward with the insights and perspectives. The innovator also creates a, uh, I'm sorry, they also receive a patient shark-tested seal 
with a three-part score broken down into engagement, value, and credibility. We've evaluated over 550 innovations globally across uh, academic medical centers, pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, uh, technology companies, accelerator programs, as well as startups. A few examples of interventions assessed have included technology, patient education, uh, research and clinical trial designs, hospital policies and processes. It's a great way to obtain perspective from patients and their caregivers on innovations designed to serve them. In addition, uh, we do have clinicians that participate in the patient shark tank to determine whether they would potentially recommend the innovation to their patients or caregivers. Some of the innovators have actually run their initiatives through the patient shark tank more than once as they continuously improve their innovation based on uh, perspectives they obtain. We're also working on a virtual patient shark tank so that patients and caregivers can evaluate innovations virtually. And I encourage you to sign up to be a patient, a caregiver, or a clinician panelist if you're interested. And if you have an innovation, please feel free to submit it uh, at patientsharktank.com. And in fact, many of our SPM members have served on uh, the patient shark tank panel. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a snapshot of what the patient shark tested seal looks like. Again, it's broken out into a three-part score around engagement, value, and credibility. Next slide. Now, another initiative focused on amplifying the voice of the patient and caregiver, as well as others across the, uh, the community, is an initiative we launched called the Magic Wand Project, where we asked the community if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about healthcare. Aside from making it free, what would you change? We've received over 7,000 responses with real-world issues that have been pretty enlightening. Uh, the ongoing survey is still open, and the responses have ranged from extremely simple to somewhat complex. And if you'd like to respond to the survey, you can do so at magicwandproject.org. Next slide. Now, as we started to sift through the responses that came in through the Magic Wand Project, we started to identify a few trends. It was uh, clear that many patients and those affected wanted to be part of solving some of those issues as well. There were many that didn't necessarily uh, realize there were solutions out there to address some of the issues they faced. And as a result, we've been working on a bit of a matchmaking tool to map the solutions, the resources, the innovations out there to the issues the community is facing in healthcare to ensure that patients and caregivers have access to these resources when they need them. Uh, here you can see a few of the main issues that came in, like I'm having issues with the cost of care, or I'm feeling alone, uh, I need caregiver support. And again, the intent is to ensure that patients are, have access to these resources at the right time. Now, if you've developed a solution to address a problem in healthcare, I encourage you to also submit it to the Magic Wand Project so that it's captured as we conduct our matchmaking. And now with this mapping, we're also able to identify where there might not be a variety of solutions and where there might be true unmet need. And based on this unmet need, uh, we co-create solutions with patients and caregivers. Next slide, please. Now one of the issues that many patients and caregivers sent in was, uh, I don't know where to start. and not sure what's credible. Uh, when I go onto the internet, do I click on the first link or all the .org's reputable sources? I'm in the midst of information overload. How do I make the best decision? So based on this need, we worked with patients, caregivers, and clinicians to co-design a platform called A Prescription to Learn, which we also refer to as the Health GPS. And basically, we've aggregated best practice content from credible sources uh, where the patient or caregiver can indicate what condition they need information on. We're initially rolling out in cancer, but adding other conditions over time. And the platform was recently recognized by the White House's uh, Cancer Moonshot Task Force as a best practice in furthering their goals. And we uh, recently launched the platform in collaboration with NYU, Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, and Moffitt Cancer Center. Next slide, please. Now, once the patient or caregiver selects their condition of interest, they then indicate what phase in the journey they're in, whether it's newly diagnosed, in the midst of treatment, uh, long-term management, etc. And all of the screen designs you see here, the icons, the flow, all of this was co-created with patients and caregivers, as well as clinicians. Next slide, please. Now, the patient or caregiver would then indicate their medium of choice. Do they want a mobile app, a book, a brochure, uh, an online community? They then receive a Yelp-style overview of credible sources of information based on their criteria. Um, they can view the resource, they can see how other patients and caregivers have rated it. 
before they use it. They can also see how a clinician, uh, whether it's a doctor, nurse, patient, educator, may have rated the resource. Next slide, please. And again, here's a, a screenshot of uh, the resources that would be pulled up based upon the search parameters. The user can also um, filter the resources by learning preference. Next slide. A clinician can also prescribe specific resources to the patient and we can then understand the information and support seeking patterns of the patient or the caregiver based on their journey phase, uh, which allows us to educate clinicians on specific needs of the patient and caregiver. The backbone of Prescription to Learn is a, uh, a science of engagement framework called the Meaningful Partnership Continuum, which is a seven phase continuum. Uh, that was created based on extensive journey mapping and interviews to identify the types of resources and support channels patients and caregivers uh, prefer, gravitate towards, based on their emotional journey. Now, if you're interested in uh, more information on Prescription to Learn or partnering on a new disease state or any of the other initiatives discussed, uh, feel free to drop me a note. Next slide. So next, I would like to introduce Ms. Nancy Finn, who holds the uh, SPM board position of secretary, and she will provide us with the patient perspective as it relates to participatory medicine. Uh, Nancy Finn is an author, a healthcare journalist, a thought leader, and patient advocate focusing on patient empowerment and engagement with the deployment of digital communication technology. Nancy? So how I became a uh, participatory medicine junkie. When I left corporate America in the year 2000 and decided to write a book on communication and technology and how it's changed the way we live and work, research led me to the healthcare industry where there was little in place and a lot needed. Having been a patient with complex medical issues myself, I had a lot of personal experience that fostered my commitment to advancing the cause of healthcare and participatory medicine. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So many thousands of hours later, and two books later, my second career, a career in healthcare, was launched with the purpose of advancing the concept of participatory medicine through writing, speaking engagements, active participation on various healthcare organizations and boards, representing the patient voice and explaining and advocating for why and how digital communication technology which has been my area of expertise for many years, must be woven into the fabric of healthcare delivery. Next slide, please. My books, my blogs, articles, and speeches present and reinforce the case for why communication, collaboration, coordination of care, and full information at the point of care are critical to the delivery of quality care for patients and why all of this is dependent upon digital communication technology. Technology that people have been using in their work and personal lives for many years, including digital records, email, portal websites, cell phones, smartphones, and associated apps. Next slide, please. A complete, accurate, coordinated health record available to patients, caregivers, providers, and other healthcare professionals is the underpinning of healthcare delivery that fosters appropriate communication and coordination of care. Other digital tools, such as email, e-visits, e-prescribing, and patient portals, contribute to the efficiency and accuracy of healthcare delivery. These tools also foster communication and collaboration, helping the mil millions of patients who deal with multiple chronic conditions Current estimates are that approximately 50% of people over the age of 65 have multiple chronic conditions in this country. This is why it is so important today that we provide the tools needed. By providing these individuals with apps and tools to use mHealth and innovative solutions including wearables, robotics, genetics and genomics to address and manage and control their health issues, this will ensure that their cost of care will be reduced, their quality of care and hopefully quality of life will increase. Part of my mission has always been to inform and educate patients about what is available to them and how to access these tools. Next slide, please. 
We know that mHealth is one of the most powerful tools we have, if for no other reason than the extensive availability of cell phones and smartphones for people throughout the world. The International Telecommunications Union, a United Nations agency, estimates that over 98% of the world's population have access to a cell phone and a growing number have access to a smartphone. This has changed traditional provider-patient relations and the delivery of basic health services, particularly in developing nations where short message systems are being used to educate and motivate patients to understand and work at preventing issues such as maternal mortality, infant mortality, malaria, HIV AIDS, and other insidious problems that arise such as Zika. Next slide, please. My continued emphasis in my writing, speaking, patient advocacy, and involvement at the United Nations on SMS, the Internet of Things, telemedicine, innovative devices and apps has been instrumental in creating knowledge and visibility for technology that did not exist a few years ago. This has been particularly powerful in helping resolve some of the disparity and inequality in access to health care services for women. Next slide, please. As a spokesperson for the Global Alliance for Women's Health and the Global Alliance for Health Promotion at the United Nations in both New York and Geneva and interacting with health ministers from throughout the world, my work at the UN has led the Commission on the Status of Women to include recognition of digital communication technology and healthcare in the Millennium Development Goals, a set of objectives to be accomplished over the next several years that will impact people throughout the world in areas of economic development, education, disparity in opportunities, and most importantly, health. Next slide, please. Like all of us, I am selective in how I spend my time. For the past five years, I have served on the executive board and board as secretary for s for pm I am also an active member of cons the Consumer Health Council and board of directors of the Mass Health Quality Partners and of course the Global Alliance for Women's Health and Global Alliance for Health Promotion. I am also on the board of several hospitals, other professional health associations, and I continue to write books, blogs, and articles. I'm currently working on a new book on how empowered healthcare consumers make good choices to stay healthy and live a longer, fulfilling life. Next slide, please. In spite of all that we are doing individually and collectively, we have much left to do, including fostering greater patient professional collaboration and better flow of information to patients, development of more and better tools, greater support for patients who need to manage complex multiple health conditions, and greater focus on gender equality issues, cost of care issues, and access to care for all. That is the end. Thank you, Nancy. So I want to encourage our uh, attendees, our, our participants, to uh, type in your questions into the chat functionality, the question functionality on your on your control panel. So next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jonathan Wald, who is current president of SPM, and he will discuss uh, research and technology-enabled care. Jonathan Wald is a physician scientist at RTI International who directs research in patient-centered technologies and has long been an advocate for partnerships among patients, caregivers, and professionals. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be uh, joining my colleagues and, uh, and presenting a little bit about, um, about our work. My goal in just a few minutes today is to um, uh, talk a little bit about RTI, which is the nonprofit that I work for, um, and then a little bit about some of the projects that we are doing or, or have done, um, just to give a taste of the ways that um, RTI projects intersect with participatory medicine and uh, collaboration uh, between patients uh, and professionals. Um, a little bit about RTI. In my experience, um, oftentimes um, uh, folks may not be familiar with RTI. Um, but it's a, it's a research institute. It's called Research Triangle Institute. It's based in North Carolina. Um, and we're pretty big. We have um, hundreds of projects going on at any, any point in time um, around the globe. Uh, and it's across 
um, many, many different areas, uh, domains of expertise, um, including healthcare, but not limited to healthcare. Um, and uh, a lot of our work is collaborative. Um, we work with universities. We do work for the government. We work for private foundations. Um, we, we do commercial work. Um, and the program that I lead at RTI is called the Digital Health and Clinical Informatics Program. Um, and as Sarah said, we are involved in different ways in the design, implementation, use, and evaluation of uh, health information technology. So we will focus on areas such as patient portals or patient-generated health data, uh, mobile devices, um, system design. Um, we're uh, very interested in usability and safety uh, and different kinds of decision support and ways to use electronic health record data. Um, and, and my background is I've, I've worn different hats um, over the years, um, trained as a physician, um, uh, also uh, in public health uh, with a master's degree, and then did an informatics fellowship where I was programming on a hospital computer system, system and doing research and seeing patients, um, have also worked in the commercial um, corporate environment at Cerner. Uh, and when I was at Partners Healthcare, led the patient portal development work there for 10 years, uh, the portal called Patient Gateway. Um, I've been involved in the Society for Participatory Medicine for a while now, since 2010, um, and I've been at RTI um, since 2011. So a couple of examples. Um, one area that uh, we've worked on is uh, the area of patient-generated health data. Um, in 2012, uh, there was research um, uh, from the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, um, where uh, we were able to write a white paper about PGHD. Uh, we testified in front of um, the Health uh, IT uh, Policy Committee, one of their work groups. Um, and we basically are promoting uh, a kind of a consistent definition and approach to understanding what is patient-generated health data and, and why is it important. And so the definition, when you see it uh, coming up in various places these days, often refers back to this white paper. Um, there's many, many different examples of patient-generated health data. It's just going to keep on expanding. Uh, it can be information uh, that a patient provides as part of a health history or a treatment history. It could be biometric data that comes um, from uh, a sensor uh, like a pulse rate or a blood pressure. Um, it can also be um, self-reported symptoms or lifestyle choices. And I put some links at the bottom of this page, um, if you're interested, later to the white paper um, and to some other resources that, um, uh, that, that address patient-generated health data. I'm the next slide button presser, so I get to do it without saying next slide, please, I guess. Um, one of the studies that... Uh, uh, that I was a, a co-PI for a number of years ago involved um, giving patients, in this case, uh, patients with type 2 diabetes, the chance to use um, a patient portal and an electronic journal to provide information before their visit uh, about their diabetes care. So, for example, um, if they had a scheduled visit in you know two weeks from today, they would go online and they'd look at their last hemoglobin A1C and their last LDL uh, uh, and cholesterol and their less blood pressure, uh, and they would answer a series of questions, and they might say, "Yeah, my medication seemed to be going okay," or "Yes, I'd like. Uh, I think I'm I'm ready uh, to be tested again with my hemoglobin A1C. It's been three months, or it's been six months, or however long." Um, they were also encouraged to review and update their medication lists before the visit, and um, we published a paper a few years ago in 2008, um, which looked at um, an intervention group of uh, diabetes patients who used the e-journal versus a control group of patients who did not. Uh, and this was a randomized study uh, by practice um, and asked the question, how do medication changes occur during the visit uh, following use of the e-journal when you compare these two groups? And what we found that was significant was that medication adjustments happened um, much more often in the intervention group then the medication adjustments happened in the control arm. And we were specifically looking um, for uh, patients who were not at their target. In other words, their blood pressure wasn't at target or their cholesterol was still high uh, or the hemoglobin A1C was, was too high. 
so that we would expect that there might be medication changes to try to help them get closer to target. And we found that the um, use of the e-journal in this randomized study um, seemed to make a difference. Um, Patient-generated health data uh, seems to have growing importance. Um, you're, you're, we're hearing about it more and more, and that's likely because patients have more data to share, um, because providers are trying to make more evidence-based decisions, and so they're looking for more information, but they're not always in a position to collect it all themselves. Uh, and also, research uh, relies on pretty granular information that can oftentimes be collected directly from patients. Um, so we expect this area to continue to grow. Um, and some of the current challenges around patient-generated health data are, are still, how do you capture it well? Um, how do you measure um, uh, really well the kind of information that patients can provide? Uh, how do you make sure that the data flows to the right person who's going to use that information, say, during a visit? And then how do you also make sure that uh, data coming from patients uh, through these mechanisms uh, is really suitable for research. It can be aggregated. Um, it can be, there's a good, a good authorization to share it, uh, and so on. So now I'm going to sh shift gears and talk about a different uh, area. And this is a project that um, we recently started. Um, there's a, a study that was funded by uh, uh, one of the NIH institutes, uh, NIDDK, um, which includes uh, diabetes and kidney diseases. And it's a five-year study, um, that, a grant that was made to Joslin Diabetes with um, RTI as a sub-grantee. Um, and, and this concerns uh, the use of continuous glucose monitoring, CGM, in older adults over 65 who have type 1 diabetes. Um, the, the problem is that this CGM technology has been studied pretty well in adults and in kids, but not so much in older adults. And the second issue is that um, Medicare doesn't really reimburse CGM for all those who are uh, taking advantage of their Medicare benefits. So um, there's an important question on the table, which is, does CGM really benefit this population over 65? And hopefully, will that increase the evidence that's needed to help uh, with policy uh, decisions that Medicare uh, is, is looking at? Um, Another challenge that, you know, we anticipate in the over 65 group has to do with technology access and technology fluency. Um, so really the aim of this project is to evaluate use of what we're calling a diabetes management platform um, to conduct user testing around it, uh, to develop training materials, um, and even to perform an economic analysis that might inform uh, policymakers as to whether ramping this up to Medicare populations would be a good idea. Um, and this is a picture that represents some of the components of this platform. Um, so you can see kind of down at the bottom where, where there's a picture of the patient and a caregiver. And they're going to be using um, uh, basically Bluetooth devices, uh, the, the glucometer um, that they use to finger stick. Um, they have an activity. They will have an activity monitor. They'll be able to deliver glucose, um, I'm sorry, deliver insulin um, using either a pump or a, a insulin pen, which will all be transmitting data over Bluetooth um, to an Android tablet that's shown kind of in the top part of the box. Um, and that tablet will be able to broadcast information to the net. Uh, and the idea is that that will allow researchers to collect data um, in real time or near real time. And it will also allow a kind of a loop uh, where professional support can be provided. And what we um, plan to do and have designed uh, is that as the data flows to the cloud, the, um, there's some clinical decision support uh, software that will look at the data and try to detect whether there are kind of clinical issues that might uh, be good to bring the, to the attention of a professional. So maybe the, the sugars are running way high, or maybe it's uh, clear that the insulin uh, is, you know, uh, they're, they're missing doses or some, something that is visible in the data, which causes a clinician to be able to respond and say, huh, let me contact them and let's take a look at that. Um, a, a different, now a third area of research, and this is being uh, done by a group uh, at RTI, Catherine Treeman and Lauren McCormack and colleagues. 
uh, is focused on patient-centered communication. And basically what this group is doing is they're di- trying to develop a reliable measure of patient-centered communication in terms of surveys um, that will be um, used in research uh, with cancer patients. And so they're doing cognitive interviews and field testing, and they're working to develop and, and, um, and validate survey items, um, which the process includes input from a stakeholder advisory panel. And this project has been going on for a few years and will wrap up uh, in April of 2018. Um, and they've already identified a number of kind of core areas that are important, they think, for uh, measuring patient-centered communication. So I've listed those six areas on the right side of the slide. Um, this last slide that I have is just to, um, to talk about some RTI-funded innovation, because some of the work that we do is um, really kind of seed, uh, sort of skunk works, or seeded by RTI itself um, uh, rather than externally funded. And so there's two examples here. One is uh, that uh, our group is focusing on patient-mediated exchange, the idea that if patients have access uh, to a patient portal, that maybe the patient can, um, can access their data um, and move it uh, to a place where researchers can access it, um, where uh, that data can get aggregated um, and uh, can be essentially more useful than just simply on the portal. Um, many patients have multiple professional providers and thus multiple portals. And so there's a, a big challenge around how do you bring data from different portals together or data from different um, uh, providers together. So that's, that's one uh, area that we're working on. Uh, and the other on the right-hand side is sensor-based research. So um, we have, um, uh, we have teams at RTI that actually, um, you know, develop sensors. Um, they're, you know, materials scientists and electrical engineers and so forth. Um, and so we're, we've developed some ultra-thin sensors that we're working with. Um, we're also working with other companies that provide these um, that can measure cardiac uh, activity and electrodermal activity and even uh, proximity um, sensors. And then using mobile devices to improve the collection from those sensors uh, and to apply analysis and predictive modeling. Uh, and two areas that uh, we're doing some work, uh, exploratory work, one is to try to see if we can anticipate addiction relapse um, in uh, patients who are being monitored using different kinds of sensors. Uh, and the second is to um, monitor emergency responders and, and police officers to understand what kind of information the biometric sensors uh, can help us to um, understand about them as they do their job and go in and out of um, some, you know, sometimes pretty stressful situations. Um, the group that's doing this work has published a systematic review, which was actually mentioned in the New York Times just last week. Uh, and uh, so I put a, a few references at the bottom of the slide. And that's my part. So um, thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Jonathan. So last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Elias, who serves as SPM's member at large, and he will provide us with an overview of sharing office notes to improve collaboration. Uh, Peter is a recently retired family uh, physician who loved every day of his 40 years of primary care practice. Well, I just love, um, I think you've jumped ahead on, no, you're okay. I just love describing how and why I've used shared offices at notes as a collaborative tool with my patients over the years. Um, it all began with the patient and his wife after uh, planning for a new and complex diagnosis. I explained to them that medical data exists in silos and they were going to need to be information managers, collect copies of his visit notes and test results, and bring them to office visits. Naturally, they asked for a copy of my note and doing his note that evening, I had an epiphany. Um, I wrote doctor's notes, not patient's notes. My careful notes described the history, findings, assessment, and plan from my perspective, and they were designed to help me rather than the patient. Next slide. So I was uh, proud of those detailed, accurate notes, but increasingly bothered by the discordance between my belief in patient engagement and my patient-centric and my physician-centric notes. I also noticed that I was 
sometimes including judgmental comments like patient vague or poor insight. And I kept wondering what the patient would think if they read my notes. And this was the first stage of my journey, realizing that the note really needed to be written so the patient could read it and understand it. Next slide. My notes began to change. I exper experimented with some complex situations, thinking through the assessment plan out loud and using more patient-friendly language, and then giving the patient the note at the end of the visit. This was a struggle at first. It was kind of new. I was really nervous about how patients would react, and I had to learn how to translate medical into English. And this partial change and how I wrote my notes was stage two. Next slide. So three magic things kind of happened. Uh, patients told me they liked getting the notes. A colleague came to me upset by a note I had written that reflected badly on the care he had provided. And my nurse Tiffany came to me and challenged me to give my notes to all my patients. Next slide. Um, to force myself to write notes with the patient in mind, I decided I needed to give every patient a copy of their note. And this was stage three, intentionally changing what I did. I began by giving just two or three patients a copy of their note every day, and I gradually increased. And by about six months, I was giving all my patients a copy of their note at the end of every visit. Next slide. So in medicine, we recognize that everything has side effects. Sharing notes is no exception. But I found that the side effects of sharing notes are actually features rather than bugs. To share notes, I had to prepare the chart in advance and do the visit out loud. And so now I'm going to talk briefly about those two things. Next slide. Every morning, I prepared the charts for the patients I was going to see that day, opening the electronic uh, record and then starting the note, reviewing the problem and medication lists, reviewing the reason for the visit, reviewing the social history. I'd often make some notes for myself in the chart about the things I thought I needed to address and some good things happened. I could make sure that important information, test results or consultation notes, was there and not missing. I could do some homework, checking the prevalence of a disease or the sensitivity of a test or use a calculator to calculate the risk for that patient of a heart attack with and without a statin. Or I could read about an unusual problem that I wasn't familiar with or look at previous notes about that problem in the chart to see what we'd already done. I could clean up the chart a little bit, get rid of last year's bronchitis from the problem list or the antibiotic from the urinary tract infection a few years ago. That makes it easier to find the important information, just like I always tell my son to clean up his room so that uh, he can find what he needs. And I looked for things that were due, abnormal test results that needed follow-up or prescriptions that needed to be refilled. Most days, this took an hour or less and it made it a lot easier for me to focus on the patient during the visit. Next slide. So the out loud visits, uh, in addition to um, preparing the chart ahead of time, had their own benefits. Um, kept us on the same page. Patients watched while I was writing. They often sat next to me. They would find errors and correct me. They often suggested better phrasing when they saw what I was typing. It became the documentation of our visit rather than my journal about my visit. Um, and something that surprised me as I was doing this, uh, I found that when we disagreed, which happens a lot, about what to do or what was going on, um, it was pretty easy and quite comfortable to note both of our different perspectives in the chart. Next slide. At this point, I was really doing my visits pretty much out loud, explaining what I was thinking, what information I was using, what I was finding on exam, uh, what options we had for diagnosis or treatment, what the advantages and disadvantages must be. And doing things out loud really facilitated doing them together. And the note then reflected our collaborative work, our assessment plan, not my personal journal. And I consider this stage four using the visit actually as a collaborative tool. Next slide. Change is hard. Um, there were challenges. Uh, it was hard to get comfortable with a new workflow after 
30 years or so of, um, of practice. It did take somewhat longer to collaborate with patients than it does just to tell them what to do and hope that they believe you. Primary care involves a lot of complicated decisions and difficult topics. Sometimes it's not so complicated. The borderline blood pressure, which I might have just not mentioned at a visit because I was running behind, um, but a patient who knows that their blood pressure is borderline or slightly elevated is more likely to check it outside the office, change his diet, try to lose some weight, or even ask me how important it is. Some of the issues, um, conversations are more complicated. Uh, things where clinicians and patients are uncomfortable talking about it or that take a lot of time. A mismatch between what the patient reports and what I think or see. Um, um, I've discovered that um, it was important, if it was important enough to put it in the chart, it was too important to hide from the patients because secrets deprive the patient uh, of the opportunity to use the information. Privacy is listed just because it wasn't really an issue. Next slide. So the benefits were huge. Um, my notes and the chart both improved. We did them together. They were more accurate. They were written in understandable language, less susceptible to error from delayed documentation, and cleaned up. As a result, the office visits were more productive. Um, the chart prep meant it was easier to focus on the patient and less on the computer. Uh, and the information, the homework, meant that the information was likely to be there. It was pretty clear to me I was giving better care. Thinking out loud and talking about what I was doing makes it really hard to skip things or be careless. Errors were found and corrected. And we were all on the same page explaining and documenting things together. Um, patients clearly liked it. I got lots of positive feedback about the, the notes helping. And lots of comments that, oh, now I understand why doctors do that. And I liked it. I felt more prepared at the beginning of the day, more organized during the visits. I did less multitasking. And I went home with all my notes done. And that was awesome. Next slide. I did get objections from colleagues and others. Uh, but the people who objected were consistently people who'd never tried it. They said things like the patients will be confused, upset, they can't handle it. This, this isn't what happens. It didn't happen in my practice, and it's not what's been found in the literature. They said it was going to be a lot of work. Well, it is somewhat more work, but it's useful work. Um, and it improved care and gave a better experience. People say, I'll have to change the way I write notes. Well, this is true, but I think of this as a feature, not a bug. Better notes are better notes. And people worried that it would increase the risk of litigation. The studies have shown that the, actually the opposite is true. Uh, the risk of litigation goes down with transparency. Next slide. So I have a very specific suggestion for the patients out there listening. Every patient should request a copy of every office visit note. And there's a good graceful way to do this. Simply say, you know, we've covered a lot today. and. I know I can't remember it all, and I know my spouse is going to have questions I can't answer. Can I have a copy of today's note and the lab and x-ray results we reviewed so I can do a better job of following through on our plan? You know, a doctor can't resist that. Next slide. I also have some suggestions for clinicians that basically boil down to try it. You'll like it. Um, Write every note, assuming your patient will read it. Prep two charts every day to see how much better those visits will be. Give two patients their note every day to see what feedback you get. And tell your patients to bring your notes to other visits. Next slide. So I'll close with this great quote from Don Berwick. The medical record properly belongs to the patient, not to the care system. It must become an open book to the patient, available without restriction, without hesitation or suspicion. Diane Plamping, a public health researcher from the United Kingdom, offered me the following rule about access to information, nothing about me without me. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, I'd like to encourage our panelists to now turn on their webcam. 
Uh, we'll open it up for the Q&A portion of the webinar. Again, if you have additional questions you haven't already um, typed in, please go ahead and type them in into the question functionality on your panel. Okay, so many of you have asked the question uh, whether or not the archive or the webinar would be shared. It will be archived. It is being recorded and we'll send out instructions for you to uh, access this. You can share it with others. Uh, those that weren't able to attend will also be able to access the webinar. So this will be shared with you and instructions will be sent uh, shortly. Okay, I'm going to start out with a question for Peter. What are the challenges or unintended consequences of sharing screen of doctor's laptop with the patient? For example, if the clinician can type his doctor's notes on his laptop and at the same time via extended desktop functionality of Windows over a separate monitor, will it not lower the risk of litigation and foster doctor-patient relationship? Yes, my experience was that it improves the um, quality and content of the conversation. Uh, it removes one concern that patients often have but rarely mention that is they don't really know what the doctor is hearing and how it's being put into the note and there's a great deal of increased confidence when not only can they see what's going in the note but they can make comments and enlarge upon it add a little bit of information. Um, it's like being able to check the order form before you click purchase when you're buying something on Amazon or um, purchasing a plane ticket. Great, thank you. Jonathan, question for you. How can patients control health data captured in mobile apps that aren't transparent about what they do with the backend data? Jonathan, we can't hear you. If you could unmute. Okay, thanks. I'm unmuted. Um, I was thinking that sounds like a stumper. How can patients control data that their uh, apps are collecting, but they, but the apps aren't uh, disclosing? I guess um, what the what they're doing with the data. Um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the starting point there is to try to understand clearly what the apps are promising and uh, as far as sharing goes and what they're promising as far as protections go. Um, and if you can't understand that, you probably need to either contact somebody who can help or assume that uh, maybe that's not a good app for you to be uh, relying on. Okay, thank you. Nancy, this question's for you. Uh, how can patients find opportunities to collaborate with clinicians and tech developers? Well, I, um, in terms of opportunities to collaborate with clinicians, I think that's an individual patient-clinician discussion that should go on between the patient and their, uh, especially their primary care physician, but uh, some of their other physicians as well. Um, I, I think that's more of a personal one-on-one um, -on -one discussion. Uh, in terms of collaboration with um, technologists, um, that would be something patients would have to determine what kind of technology they're looking for and um, seek out uh, the developers of technology and perhaps uh, discuss with them what is available. I mean, I, I think reading articles, um, blog posts, and other things will give them hints as to what is most available. And what was that third category you asked me? Uh, let's just take a look here. Tech developers. Well, I think I addressed just now tech developers. Right. Clinicians uh, and tech, tech developers was the question. With the, with the two. Okay. So, um, you know, it's, they're, it, it's very different developing a collaborative relationship with a clinician that you are directly involved in uh, to address some of your health issues and um, developing collaborations with technologists which is really a you know it's kind of a healthcare industry issue um, where you have to you know go on a LinkedIn to find connections that would be appropriate right absolutely 
And then just to tag on to that, you know, the intent of Patient Shark Tank as well was to encourage collaboration among patients and tech developers so that if a startup company was creating a neat app to address uh, an unmet need, um, the goal was to ensure that they were obtaining patient perspective throughout the design, the development, the continuous improvement of that mobile app, for instance. So really it's critical that we uh, integrate the patient perspective early on and not just obtain feedback on the back end. So there's plenty of opportunity there as well to ensure that, again, as we're in the midst of technology explosion, uh, we're also integrating the patient voice, the caregiver voice. So this next question is for Peter. Uh, how long was an out loud visit and did you notice any effect on treatment and or drug adherence? Well, out loud visits um, did slow me down some. Uh, as I said, uh, explaining things takes longer than giving orders. Um, it did seem um, in the long run that it was more efficient and more effective, so I think although it may have taken a little bit more time uh, up front, it resulted in fewer errors and you know if you don't have time to do it right the first time, where are you going to find time to start all over? Uh, it definitely made a big difference in how well patients were able to follow through on the plan that they and I had worked out together as opposed to them complying with what somebody else told them. One of the um, one example is that in the process of doing this and having patients come back having struggled with part of the plan, as I learned to ask them when we were doing the plan, what part of this plan are you going to have the most trouble with? Is there something we can do to problem solve that? Um, and that kind of collaborative work that's facilitated by doing it out loud together and recording what you're doing, so the note becomes a transcription rather than my journal, um, improves their ability to take care of their own health. Great, thank you. Uh, so a few questions came in regarding prescription to learn, um, regarding our hospital partners. So although we launched with um, NYU, MD Anderson, uh, Moffitt, and uh, Mayo Clinic, um, we do have a network of 1,200 hospitals and community practices that we're working with to launch uh, prescription to learn, um, including California, which was the, the question that came in. And we're actually integrating prescription to learn into CME activities so that the clinician can be taught on new treatment options in a specific condition, but then also how to educate and engage the patient with links to specific resources that are recommended in prescription to learn. So it gives them the option to prescribe the resources and then to see if the patient filled that information prescription. And it allows the patient uh, caregiver to also navigate above and beyond what the clinician prescribed. So for instance, if the clinician prescribed an informational resource and the patient gravitated towards uh, supportive or more motivational resources, there's an opportunity to um, educate the clinician on the need to prescribe social support and things of that sort when that patient's newly diagnosed. And, and that's really the intent of uh, the information support seeking patterns of uh, understanding the data, it's really to, to recognize what types of resources, tools, services the patients, the caregivers are gravitating towards so that the clinician can also be um, educated um, on, again, what, what needs the patient might have based upon their journey phase. Uh, let's see, this question is for Jonathan. Uh, could you talk about how secure patient-generated data is on medical equipment and mobile devices? Okay, one second. Okay. Um, you know, I think the security of data on mobile devices just depends a lot on um, the not only the device itself, the hardware, but also the software that you're using on the device. Um, so it really comes down to, to case by case. Um, for example, um, much data like if you look at if you look at consumer devices like Fitbits um, or other kinds of trackers, um, they're generally intended to restrict the information to the user, um, but share the information completely with the company. And then the company oftentimes in their um, user agreements, um, you know, 
uh, puts language in there that says that they're allowed to uh, share oftentimes anonymized data or use the data for internal research and so on. Um, uh, what's really interesting, I think, if you look at a company like Google, is the tremendous amount of information, very granular information that Google collects when we use their email, when we use the Chrome browser, uh, when we run those apps on different devices, um, because all of their features that are intended to help us be mobile and, say, start an activity on one device and move it to the next um, requires data sharing that we like. Um, but on the other hand, if you start to get worried about data sharing, then you might, um, you know, you might feel, feel otherwise. Um, so I, it's, a, it's something that I think what, what's kind of been shown over and over is that um, each of us is generally very, very willing to give up all kinds of data uh, about ourselves when we feel we're getting something out of it. Um, or when we're not looking very critically, hypercritically at, uh, at the tools that we're using. Um, but at the same time, if you're asked on a survey or if you're kind of, um, uh, kind of cornered with the question of how do you feel about security and privacy, uh, a lot of us will say, well, that's really important to us and we think it should be protected. So there's a little bit of, um, uh, of sort of a, a difference between, I think, what people say when asked and what people typically do. Um, but the general answer is you have to um, you have to really look into each device that that you're using. Um, there are research grade devices like um, the especially consumer devices like Apple Health Kit uh, is an example which has pretty solid security built into it. Um, uh, so at least the 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 system is capable of being quite secure. It's still a matter of how well it's configured when it's being used. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Nancy, can you talk about how participatory medicine and the deployment of digital communication technology is taking root in other nations around the world? It's a big question for a very small amount of time, but sure, very briefly, um, slowly. Um, certainly, as I indicated in my talk, on, uh, in the developing nations, the chief uh, device that's being used for digital communication is the cell phone and they're doing really inventive and creative things uh, using cell and smartphones to communicate uh, test results and procedures and uh, from remote villages uh, where healthcare workers uh, are generating these procedures into major medical centers uh, in the capital cities of these countries. In Europe um, the situation is quite different, quite quite a bit like ours. Most of the European nations have a national health system um, and so many are more advanced than we are because uh, once the mandate is out there to adopt electronic records or other digital technology, um, it happens and it's uh, not dealt with in, in quite the political way that we are dealing with these things. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, um, it's coming it's taken a long time. When I started this 15 years ago, it was a it was a big stretch to believe that digital health records would become ubiquitous in our country, um, and they have become ubiquitous um, for the most part here among most clinicians and abroad. Uh, similar things are happening in the developed nations. In the developing nations, uh, no, there's not that kind of um, infrastructure for uh, using the internet and um, uh, electronic records and, the, and those kinds of technologies quite yet. But it's mostly smartphone and cell phones and that's pretty remarkable with what they're doing. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you to all our presenters. Um, again, many thanks to all of our uh, attendees for taking the time to log on to the first learning exchange. I, I want to encourage each and every one of you to submit your work, whether it's uh, research or a thesis you're in the midst of, uh, policy you're helping to advance, an online community or survey you've created, or a best practice or a hack that you've created as a participatory patient or a caregiver or a clinician. If it falls under the umbrella of participatory medicine, we encourage you to share and become a contributor to the Learning Exchange. Uh, you can submit your work using the link that's on the screen. And if you have any questions, additional questions, feel free to reach out to me at sarahkrug at cancer101.org and we'll ha be happy to answer them. Uh,
And if you're not a member, we welcome you to join the society at participatorymedicine.org. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.